Uh, so, so, so that's why I said it enables the faculty here to really do gr even greater things, you know, because they can do great things, you know, by doing this line. Matter of fact, people like John Grotzinger uh, told me that he came to Caltech because he wanted the connection with JPL. Uh -huh. And many other faculty told me the same thing, you know, particularly in astronomy, in, uh, in uh, uh, planetary science, and, and in the astronomy, you say, why would they come? It, it was, you know, Caltech is heavily instrumentalist. So these are astronomers who like to build instruments developing the latest technology, you know, in detectors. And that's one of the strengths of JPL, you know, because we build the instrument. Uh, uh, so we have uh, a, a, a lab, which is called the Micro Devices Lab, which really at the leading edge of developing advanced technology for detector, and for integrated circuit. And that lab, you know, was started by Lou Allen, you know, that uh, he arranged for the funding, you know, for it. And many faculty told me they came to, to Caltech because of their access to the micro devices lab at JPL and, and working on instrument and missions at JPL. Another, fact, I would say, uh, looking at memories of Caltech, uh, I'm sitting now in the office at uh, Jim Wasserberg, uh, Used to have, he was a very well known, you know, uh, one of the leaders, uh, you know, in the field. And next door, sorry, uh, Jim, Jim Westfall. Uh, Jim Wasserberg was next door. But I'm sitting in the office of Jim Westfall, and he's the guy who conceived and worked with JPL to build the main camera for the Hubble telescope. Right. So, so he was an intellectual leader, and JPL actually built it, you know, for him. Charles, another mission-oriented question I wanted to ask about was Ulysses. Specifically, I'm curious about the way that a spacecraft is designed to study the sun in a different way than one that's designed to study a planet. What are some of the technical challenges in getting reliable data from a spacecraft that, by definition, if it gets too close to the target, it's going to burn up? Yeah, no, in actuality, it's interesting because... Uh... I mean, the solar system is big. And as you get closer to the sun, you know, you have a different environment as if you are going to Mars or you are going to Jupiter. Uh, but uh, one thing interesting about Ulysses uh, was it really didn't get very close to the sun, but we put it in a polar orbit, which allowed us to image the sun from above. Uh, now, the challenge on almost all our missions, like Ulysses or the mission which we sent to Venus, or the mission that we sent to Mercury, is you are going to get a lot of heat coming from the sun. And you cannot hide, there is no shade. You cannot go under a tree and hide from the sun <laughs> illumination. So the sun is shining on you all the time. So for the, the mission which are getting closer to the sun or, or roughly the distance of the sun, even when we are you know, at, uh, you know, at Mars altitude, uh, we have to put uh, blankets, you know, on it, which like aluminum foil, which tend to reflect the sunlight and protect the spacecraft, you know, to, to keep the temperature at, uh, at uh, uh, the electronics at a reasonable temperature. So that's why you see a lot of these spacecraft has what looks like aluminum foil, you know, on them. And you see louvers, you know, which allows us to control how much energy is emitted. Now, the fortunate thing is it's not the shade, but the part of the spacecraft looking away from the sun gets very cold because it's not getting the sunlight. So there is a lot of challenge of how you manage your thermal, you know, environment. When you are going away from the sun, like going on Galileo or on Cassini, you would see black blankets because in that case, we are getting so cold, we want to keep the heat. So we have the reverse, you know, problem, you know, of doing that. So managing the temperature on the spacecraft is probably one of the most challenging, you know, uh, expertise if you want. And there are a whole group at JPL uh, which uh, work on managing the thermal, you know, property of the spacecraft. Uh, and the same thing for the rovers, you know, on Mars. The environment is very cold, and 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 even worse, uh, the challenge we have is when the spacecraft is spinning. So a period of it goes from dark to light, dark to light. So you, you, you have a big excursion of the temperature. And when you are on Mars, you have excursion of temperatures every day. So
So managing the thermal environment is one of the key challenges on the spacecraft. And why the sun's poles? Why the focus for Ulysses on the poles of the sun? Well, because we cannot see them from Earth. So, I mean, there, there are a lot of work in understanding of the sun, which have been happening, you know, from ground telescope. I mean, matter of fact, that one, one of the foundation of Caltech were solar telescope on Mount Wilson, you know, which were hail came to Pasadena and then led to attract noise and Millikan and founded Caltech. So we owe something to the sun, you know, and that, that uh, I mean, it was brother than the sun than doing that. But you cannot see the poles, you know, from the ground. And the other part is not only taking images of the sun itself, but also looking at what's being emitted from the sun. So the whole environment between us and the sun actually doing in situ measurement and seeing what's being emitted from the sun and uh, what's the composition, how does it impact Earth and impact the planet. So it's a broader thing than just imaging, you know, the sun. I mean, now, you know, there are missions that are being developed, which is actually go much closer to the sun, you know, than, than Ulysses, you know, has done that. So we can get much higher imaging resolution, you know, than from ground telescope, you know, on the sun and to study very close environment. And, and those have their own challenge because basically you have to put literally a heat shield and you still have to see through that heat shield or have a hole to be able to, to see through it because the temperature can go way high. So, uh, so it's a little bit like the heat shield that we built for the entry in, in Mars. That heat shield had to sustain temperatures up to like 2000 degrees centigrade that's the kind of temperature and heat shield that is needed as you get closer to the sun to protect the spacecraft. So with this newfound visibility that Ulysses saw the poles, what do we now know of the sun as a result? Well, I should say I'm not an expert in the sun, but we, we find that the sun is not like when, when I grew up, it was this hot, you know, big ball. I mean, there is a lot of activity happening on the sun, very heavily driven you know, by the magnetic field of the sun, you see all kinds of dynamic cells which are happening. So the sun is a very dynamic and active, uh, you know, uh, uh, object, if you want, or a star. So it's giving us insight about star. I mean, think about it as a nuclear reactor, which is active. You know, you have a nuclear reaction happening, you know, in near time in this big ball on it. And, and the atmosphere is very dynamic with solar flares, uh, you know, very similar to a little bit to what we see on Jupiter, that it's a very dynamic, you know, atmosphere and what looks like big hurricanes, which are happening. So it's a very dynamic, you know, object. Uh, that's about the extent of my, my knowledge about it. <laughs> what about the specific question of the threat posed by solar flares? Did the Ulysses mission yield additional insight into this? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was to understand how often the solar flare happened, uh, what's being emitted from the sun, because, you know, solar flares have significant impact, particularly on modern Earth, because we use a lot of telecommunication, we have a lot of satellite in orbit, so solar flares, the particles being emitted for solar flares could have a lot of impact on orbiting spacecraft and on, uh, and, uh, on uh, the, in the communication network we have on Earth. So, so being able to understand and predict, you know, solar plays is, has a lot of practical implication. Matter of fact, uh, one of the things we keep uh, attention to, uh, you know, on many of our missions, not only on Earth, but the deep space mission, is if we see solar flares happening, I mean, it takes them a while to propagate. You know, they are not moving at the speed of light, but they are moving at significant speed. So we get a warning for our spacecraft that solar flare are happening. So we tend to turn the spacecraft in a geometry like have the antenna kind of looking toward the sun because that gives us some protection because it's a piece of metal. So, so that gives the electronic some protection from the solar flare. So it, uh, it had a lot of practical, you know, application for both our spacecraft as well as the, the communication networks on Earth. Charles, back to planet Earth and a topic for which you were intimately involved, and that is the mission to find the lost city of Ubar. Tell me how you got involved in that, and how initially did you connect with Nicholas Clapp? 
Well, it's interesting. So after the uh, after the work in Egypt and got all the attention in National Geographic, uh, one day a member of my team by name of Ron Blom at JPL uh, got a call from uh, a Nick Clapp uh, because he knew him a little bit and he was kind of a uh, how to say an amateur archaeologist but also involved in documentary. So Nick Clapp, I mean, he didn't want to contact me directly, so I thought because he knew Ron Blom a little bit, so he went through Ron and he told Ron, you know, uh, Nick Clapp, he was doing some research at the Huntington Library, you know, looking at old document, and there is a number of these maps which refer to this uh, to this uh, city called Ubar, uh, which was the center of trade, you know, 2,000 years ago, and that was the frankincense caravans used to stop through that city. So it had connection to the Bible, and it was mentioned in the Bible for, for the frankincense trade. And it's located very close to the boundary between Oman and Saudi Arabia. And as uh, you know, the, a lot of the frankincense used to come from Oman and from Yemen. It's a sap of a specific kind of trees. So, and he heard that we are planning the Serb mission at that time. So Ron Blanc comes to me and he says, you know, would you be willing to meet with this guy, Nick, uh, you know, uh, Clap, Nick Clap? I thought I'm sure, you know, I was always interested in particularly if it had connection with the Middle East and, uh, and archaeology. So he came over and he brought copies of these documents uh, showing, you know, the maps and they go all the way back to the maps by Ptolemy, you know, showing what looked like city in, the, in that area. And he said, is there any chance you can turn on the radar on Serbi over that area to see what do we see? So I was intrigued by it, and I said, heck, what is there to lose? We most likely will be flying over that area. It's a question of turning on the radar. So, so we planned on doing this. We had no idea what to expect or what to see. So we turned on the radar over that region. The data came back. We started looking at it, and then we looked both at the radar data and the Landsat data. So we had both you know, kind of some penetration with the radar and surface images. And we see these features roughly in that area. We see long linear features, which later we found it's an indication of where a camel caravan used to travel. And it's amazing how much remnant of them stays even after 2,000 years. Or, and uh, that's where you see some of the uh, trade routes in many areas, because I did then a lot of work in Saudi Arabia. Even from that time, it kind of disrupts the surface a little bit and they get covered by sand. But with the penetration of the radar, you can see some of the pebbles, they reflect differently than the sand. So anyway, we said, well, let's go there. And it turned out, uh, you know, the, the, there were a couple of archeologists who had connection, you know, in Oman. So we arranged to go and do a field trip. And the archeologists and Ron Blum, they planned on spending a month. I couldn't, you know, spend that long you know, time in there. By then I was the head of the division. So I went for a week and it was a great trip. You know, I remember uh, landing in Muscat, Oman, and that trip was in, uh, uh, there were some people had connections to the Sultan of Oman. Uh, we had a couple of British explorers who came with us and they knew the Sultan. So they put me in this super fancy hotel. I mean, it was complete contrast with Egypt where I stayed in a tent. You know, here I stayed in this fancy, fancy hotel. And then flew from there to a town called Salala, which is in southern, close to the Yemen border. And that's where we all got together. And then we drove uh, about maybe uh, about six, seven hours away from it toward the area where we saw those linear features. Uh, and there in that area, effectively, to make a long story short, what we found out that there were wells which are still explored now, and there was some a small town, you know, with, uh, you know, with uh, agricultural field around that oasis. But we found the foundation of what looked like a major fort. So really, the city of Ubar was more likely a fort were surrounding that well. Uh, and that was common in that part because many of the caravans, they wanted to protect, you know, where the wells are. So they used to travel in caravan, get into those forts, and that's where they get supplies, you know, of water. 
and then it led to almost a 15 years of uh, excavation of getting the foundation you know a much more expensive extensive uh, area of the foundation of those fort and and uh, more recently i got involved in uh, in helping in the foundation of university in oman i got to know people so they asked me to be on the, the advisory board and when i mentioned Ubar, say, oh, were you part of that expedition? Uh, some people knew it, and some younger people they didn't know that. And now it's one of the main tourist attraction in uh, uh, in Ubar. So recently, literally about four or five months ago, I went and googled Ubar, and of course it comes a uh, Omani tourist office, and they had pictures of people in that area, and uh, you know tourists visiting that area. So that was one of the exciting benefits, similar to, uh, to uh, what happened, you know, in Egypt. And uh, making a, a loop, close the loop on, on how things happen. Uh, I always was a big fan of the hunting trip. When I was a student, I used to go there to the garden and, and do my homework, uh, you know, in the, sitting in the garden and I was a member. And then recently they asked me to join the board of governors, you know, of the hunting trip. So I, I told all of them, you know, you know, that's how we led, led us to the city of Ubar. You know, it's a, a archaeologist doing research in the old documents, you know, at the Huntington, which led to this. So it's amazing how these events interconnect, you know, at the different times. Is it understood that Ubar, when it was inhabited, was a different climate than it currently is? Uh, I don't know about that, that, that part, but uh, clearly it was uh, the whole route from Ubar uh, to Petra was the trade routes coming from the frankincense because not only the frankincense was in the bible but it was very valuable by the pharaohs because it was used in uh, in uh, you know after the pharaohs died i think that's one of the things i don't understand i don't remember the chemistry of it and it was used a lot in the early churches in fact as i said earlier i uh, i was in a boarding school in lebanon and every day i used to go to the mass and we used to use that incense, you know, for the, you know, the incense at the, the Oriental churches, you know, that uh, was very common. So incense was a very valuable, you know, product, you know, at that time. And the caravans used to go from Yemen, Oman, come to where Ubar now. And then there was a series of forts, you know, in Saudi Arabia, you know, which even exists until now, uh, that, uh, that used to lead all the way to uh, where Petra, you know, is where, uh, where uh, the, 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 that uh, that was a main center for the trading. You know, during the Roman times and before that, uh, and uh, and I uh, more recently, about seven eight years ago, uh, because I was visiting a university in Jeddah, uh, they took us on a tour to a, to an area, archaeologic area called uh, Madain al Saleh. And that was exactly like Petra, but not as developed or explored. Uh, and now it's becoming one of the main tourism, you know, areas. So it's kind of all tied up with the caravans, which used to travel there. Charles, this question would connect all of your work in the Middle East, in the Sahara, in Egypt, in the Arabian Peninsula. And that is the value of your Middle Eastern heritage and, of course, your Arabic language abilities. In what ways did that make your work more productive, more satisfying, more successful? Yeah, it, it, it did help in a lot because, you know, particularly as I became the director of JPL, uh, there was a lot of private, and I was in all over magazines, you know, matter of fact, one of the magazines in the Arab Emirate, uh, which was purely a, a, a kind of like a fashion magazine, uh, about, and it, they used to do every year who are the most influential Arabs in the world. And I was always in the top five, you know, the thing, because it was exciting to have a person from Arab descent, Lebanese descent, uh, being the director of JPL and, and doing the exploration because, you know, space exploration is fascinating, you know, all over the world, not, not only in the US. So yeah, it did help, you know, a fair amount, uh, you know, because people, you know, kind of associated with it. So. So I, I remember at one time the, the CEO of Aramco, you know, the biggest company in the world, or sec now second biggest, you know, after uh, Apple, uh, you know, was visiting Caltech. You know, I arranged 
for him to come and visit Caltech and GTL. Uh, and they were chatting and he was telling the friend, you know, Charles is the most famous Arab in the Middle East. <laughs> <laughs> so it made, made me feel good. And, and yeah, it opened doors. Uh, you know, the other very famous one was Ahmed Zouel, that he was professor here at Caltech. He passed away a number of years ago and he was the first Nobel laureate, you know, with uh, Egyptian from Egypt. So Ahmed and I were two very well known people in the Middle East. Uh, because of that kind of scientific, you know, connection. Uh, and, and that led to a, a number, you know, particularly after I stepped down from JPL, now I'm on the advisory board of a number of universities in the Middle East, AUB, one of them, which is the American University in Beirut, which, by the way, today's announcement of the Nobel laureate in physics did his early undergraduate study in the American University of Beirut. And oh. his other, now he's a uh, Lebanese-American, very famous. You know, he's now at Scripps, and uh, he's an undergraduate, uh, sorry, graduate at Caltech. So he, he got the Nobel laureate, uh, no, sorry, not physics, but physiology and medicine. Uh -huh. You know, that was announced yesterday or before yesterday. So that's another famous Lebanese American, you know, or, uh, you know, uh, involved in science and Caltech. You know, so Caltech owns all three famous Lebanese American or Egyptian American, you know, with uh, Ahmed Zubayr and myself. And, uh, and the recent uh, uh, Nobel laureate. Uh, so I'm involved in a number of universities now in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Oman, uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, on their advisory board, on those, uh, as well as in the Young Space Agency in the Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia. Also, I serve on their advisory boards. Charles, I'm curious about the value of knowing where there are oil deposits and focusing radar technology in those areas based on the simple deductive reasoning oil deposits come from carbon carbon comes from life this must have been you know a heavily forested area full of flora and fauna at some point i wonder if that's really central to thinking about how climates change over time yeah no i mean in a sense it is i mean it's a long time ago that uh, there were forests you know, in those areas. Uh, but clearly, like the work in Egypt where we saw those drainage channels is an indication of the climate change which happened locally, in, I mean, or regionally uh, in that case. Um, you know, and uh, now where radar or my background serves more beneficially is being able to not only image geologic features, which then geologists interpret to look at oil location and oil field. But, uh, but uh, one of the most recent technologies that had been developed using radars, one is being able to measure the biomass in forests. So basically because the radar penetrates through a forest and scatters from the trees, by doing some certain analysis, what we call polarization and multispectral, we can derive the amount of biomass which is in the trees. And by monitoring that over long term and the connection between biomass and carbon dioxide, you know, in the atmosphere, a number of researchers are starting to use that as a tool of prediction of how much we are doing damage, if you want, or, or, or uh, solutions for our climate change of being able to suck in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere or the emission by, by the cutting of the, uh, I mean, or the destruction, you know, of the forest. So that's one whole area where when I was doing my early research, we didn't know about very well. But then there was some work that I did at the tail end of my research career. And now it has evolved significantly in, uh, in being able to make some biomass. And that traces its background, the technique, when we did Sir C, which was a much more advanced at Sir A and Sir B. The other one, which is even more recent, and that traces its uh, uh, legacy <coughs> shuttle radar topography mission, which is the one with the long boom and doing interferometry. Some of my colleagues here, like Mark Simon, who's a professor you know, at Caltech, and uh, Paul Rosen, who is a visiting professor, but is at the JPL, is developing and using a technique we call radar interferometry. And what that technique does is we take a radar image. If we come back a couple of days later or a couple of weeks or a couple of months and take an image of the same area, 
And by comparing the two, we can measure surface changes down to centimeters. Now you would say, well, what's the benefit of that? And what does that have to do with global change? Well, it has to do that or not, when you are pumping water from under the surface, the surface subsides a little bit. And when you put water back into the aquifer, let's say from one snowmelt, the surface goes up a little bit. When you pump oil, the surface goes down a little bit. So by monitoring over long term how the surface is changing, we can infer how much water is being pumped. And that's a big deal, particularly in the Middle East, about depleting the water tables in the Middle East. And that's why now I get a fair amount of funding from Saudi Arabia to do research in that area of monitoring the depletion of the water across the Middle East and how to manage the water better. And that's activity that's being done with my colleagues, Mark Simon uh, and Jean-Philippe Avouac, who's another professor. Yes, yeah, so the three of us are involved. Now that I have time to do research again, uh, we are involved in using satellite radar images to monitor one element being impacted, you know, by climate change and, and the depletion, you know, of water. So it's interesting how these early developments, Sir A, Sir B, Sir C, SRTM, which were done in the 80s, led to technologies that now is being used internationally by many, many space agencies, many commercial companies, you know, to be actually look at things which impact our environment. And all of them trace back their technological, you know, uh, history back to these shuttle series of uh, missions. And, and it's interesting because I remember uh, about uh, four or five years ago, uh, even after I stepped down from being the director of JPL, uh, I knew a number of people internationally. So I was in Paris and I went to visit the head of the ESA, European Space Agency. So he told me, he said, oh, I want you to meet uh, the guy who's the head of the Earth Science. So he took me to his office. His name is Ashbacher. So I walk in his office and he said, hi, Dr. Elashi, I'm uh, Joseph Ashbacher. And he pulled him up and said, and I studied in your book, you know, the textbook that I have on remote sensing. So, uh, so that kind of people trace a lot of those activities. And now, Joseph Ashbacher is the new head of the European Space Agency. Oh, wow. Well, I usually communicate with him for that, and we become kind of, uh, uh, not close friend, but reasonably good friends. And he keeps reminding me, you know, about the traceability of the European missions back to these shuttle missions that, uh, that were done. Charles, I can't help but ask, but in your work studying the water crisis in the Middle East, if this research is relevant closer to home for our own water crisis here in the American West. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because matter of fact, uh, the technique was uh, was uh, perfected in the Central Valley of California. You know, so we have been monitoring the Central Valley for the last six, seven years now. And you can see we have plots which show uh, during the summer, the surface kind of you know, deplete a little bit, goes down a little bit during the winter when the Sierra melts, you can see the water going up, but on the average, it's going down uh, because of all the water pumping. And now the Department of uh, Agriculture and Water Department in California is starting to use that data to help manage more intelligently about doing uh, the pumping. And, uh, and many of the large farmers are starting to use that that data. Some of them are on the board of trustees at Caltech, uh, where they are starting to use that data to gain a better understanding of how they are, uh, how the water is being uh, pumped out and utilized. Charles, back to outer space. Let's go to Mars. <laughs> okay. In the early 1990s, to put the Mars mission in perspective, the Mars Observer, what was our knowledge of the surface of Mars up to that point? And how did that knowledge inform the technology and, ear and engineering that went into the Mars Observer? Well, uh, the, I mean, uh, the, the knowledge in the early days, I mean, from the Mariner spacecraft, uh, was fairly limited, except when we did Viking. When we did Viking, and again, I was not involved in Viking, 
Uh, that was the first time we put a lander on the surface of Mars, so it gave us a first look, you know, on the surface. But even then, our uh, resolving power, the imaging that was done from satellite, was not as exquisite as what we have done, you know, at a later time uh, on Luna. So when we started, then I would say in, uh, get my years right, in the late, in the early 90s, we started putting more and more sophisticated instruments on our orbit, you know, and, uh, around Mars. And we started seeing features that we didn't expect, you know, or we didn't see, be it uh, what looked like volcanic flows, uh, what uh, looked like riverbeds, you know, on the, on the surface of Mars, uh, alluvial fans. So suddenly we were seeing a lot more features. And that got inputted into the mission, which we did in the 2000 time frame, like Mars Observer and, uh, and uh, the series of missions after that. Uh, and, and now we are at the capability where we can image down to like literally meters. I mean, we matter of fact, you know, we have almost better resolving images of Mars than of Earth uh, because of uh, we are not limited by any uh, classification or restriction, military restriction, you know, on, on Mars. So we, we have cameras which can get us down to the meter, a couple of meter, you know, resolving power, you know, on them. So, yeah, I mean, the progression uh, is amazing what happened in the last 20 to 30 years about the size of cameras that we put on, the sensitivity of the focal plane, and a key factor is the data that we can transmit, because it doesn't help you to take very high resolution images if you cannot send them down, you know, to Earth, because that brings you back to the deep space network, and, and the advances which have happened in being able to get significantly more data and using higher frequency because in the communication the higher frequency you do the more data you can bring to earth so in the old days we use what we call l band which is like one gigahertz uh, and that had limitation then we moved to x band which was about 10 gigahertz so that gave us an order of magnitude more uh, data capacity then we developed one to what we call k band which is in the 30 20 to 30 gigahertz. So it was both an evolution of getting higher and higher and higher frequency, and then getting the capability of coding and power to be able to transmit a lot more data. So now we get, I mean, on Voyager, we the rate data rate, you know, if I could type maybe faster than the data rate of Voyager. Now, you know, you, you can get a deluge of data coming down, you know, from uh, from uh, from the space based on the advances in technology, you know, that has happened. So that translated in getting much more detailed images, much more understanding, you know, and that helped tremendously in planning our landers. You know, where do we land our spacecraft? Similar question as to Venus, but much more plausible given, given the fact that it's Mars. When the Mars Observer mission was launched, what were some of the optimism, both in terms of finding evidence of life on Mars, but then additionally, long-term thinking out the possibility of habitability of Mars through terraforming or other means? Yeah, well, all across the Mars program, I mean, Mars Observer is one element of it, and there were a number of, before that, the Mariner missions and, uh, and the missions that we have now there is always this dream that there might be life on Mars. And all the scientific indication kind of supports that Mars was habitable. You know, as scientists, we have to be very careful, you know, what the words we use. I mean, uh, particularly when we communicate with the public. So, so, uh, so even at that time, there was a lot. Well, after Viking, uh, it was kind of a, like a setback uh, because there was a lot of expectation and hope. And then when Viking landed and made experiments, I mean, they measured if there is an organic material and came up with no organic material. So a number of people immediately said, well, there is no life. Mars is not habitable. But when you, we look at the images from satellite, there was all kinds of indication which look very much like Egypt. You know, I said, you see these riverbeds. Uh, you see, uh, you know, what looks like features which were carved 
you know, by rivers. So it kind of led many people to think, you know, maybe in the early days, Mars was much more humid, if you want, and therefore much more amenable to life. And then when we landed in the polar region, and we did very close to the polar cap, just digging a few centimeters, you know, from the surface, we actually see H2O, frozen water in the surface. So it, it comes by logic that if there was water which created those river and now it's frozen, that maybe at an early time, Mars might have been warmer than it is today. And therefore, maybe it was very similar to Earth because the two were formed roughly at the same time. Uh, Mars is not much farther than Earth, so the environment you know, I mean, even today, you know, during the day on Mars at noon, the temperature is a little bit like what we have in Pasadena, you know, in the winter months kind of frame. So it's very amenable. And the key question is, could have life evolved, you know, in those early days when water was flowing on the surface? And in some location, we do see what looked like flows uh, because there is change. You see it one day, and then this following day, it looks like a flow happened. So people think maybe water actually, the, or the ice had melted and there was some flow which happened. And that came from being able to observe globally at very high resolution and on continuous basis. And that's where the different missions, you know, that the orbiters that we put on around Mars enabled to do that, to do a continuous monitoring of what's happening, you know, on Mars. So yeah, there is always, and you know, as humans, we always want to think that there might be life, you know, somewhere else. So it is a combination of scientific fact and a little bit of wishful thinking, uh, which is nothing bad about in science. It's always this kind of a little bit of science fiction, which keep us to be thinking outside the box and outside of the normal limitation, which lead to major discoveries. So I wouldn't be surprised I would be delighted, you know, if uh, the latest rover Perseverance was collecting samples, we might see some indication, you know, past life or when we bring the sample. Uh, and of course, it would be a major thing, but I wouldn't be saying, oh, it's a miracle. No, I would say it's a surprise, but not a miracle. Charles, what were some of the biggest surprises yielded by Mars Observer? Well, I mean, uh, the biggest surprises on all of them were were these channels that we see, because up to uh, I mean, the first early Mariner mission, we didn't have the details. So at least from my perspective, I mean, other scientists would have different perspectives, is what you see is that uh, these alluvial fans are very common. You know, you see them everywhere, and they clearly were happen due to water flows, similar to what we see in Death Valley, uh, the extensive network of rivers, uh, uh, dry rivers, you know, that you see in there and what looks like, you know, uh, dry lakes. And and it reminds me because I I drive a lot. Uh, I, I love Dust Valley. I used to take my students there for field work and then driving up to Mammoth Lakes through the Owens Valley where there are lots of dry lakes. So these are things that I used to see. And then when we look at Mars, we see something very similar. Of course, we saw much more detail with the rover than with the orbiters. But the orbiters gave us a very clear indication that there are dry lakes and dry rivers. Uh, these lakes are mostly made of salt, you know, leftover salt, you know, on the surface. So, uh, so these are probably one of the biggest surprises which happened as we were getting better and better uh, resolution. Charles, to put exploration on Mars in historical context in the early 1990s, was anybody thinking of the possibility that mega billionaires like Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos would become major players in, in questions about Mars research and habitability? Did anybody think along those lines 30, 40 uh, years ago? Not, not really. I mean, there was a lot of thought about science fiction, you know, and there were movies and all of these things. And and uh, not only for Mars, but also for the moon uh, and, and uh, you know, for Europa even. Uh, so there was a lot of, you know, science fiction kind of movies. But the question of uh, private sector and really didn't start until like maybe 10 years ago when you had people like Elon Musk 
And, and I think part of it is this is a generation of people which grew up through the space exploration era, you know, where we had exploring Mars and, and talk about habitability on Mars uh, and having stations on the moon. So I think the young people who were young when we were landing on the moon and exploring Mars and so on, uh, so some people grew through it and then they became millionaires completely outside of space. I mean, uh, you know, Elon Musk had nothing to do with space. He started with PayPal. So, uh, so having visionary people like this and, and Jeff Bezos uh, on doing that kind of is more a recent event, you know, I would say in the last decade. And it's great to have visionary like this, you know, to, to be thinking out of the box, you know, on doing that. Now, sometimes they go overboard, you know, and talking about we are going to inhabit Mars in the next decade. You know, matter of fact, I remember a discussion was with Elon Musk because he used to come regularly to JPL. And he was telling me one day, oh, I'm going to have a human on Mars, you know, within five years. I thought I quietly looked at him. I told him, Elon, it's great to have your vision. But I landed stuff on Mars, you know, rovers. And I know how tough it is. You are talking about 15 to 20 years. And that was in the 90, in uh, 2008 that he was going to land people on Mars in 2022. Well, we are in 2021 when we are 10 years away from that. So, so reality hit him. But I still love people who are always optimistic. I mean, I'm an optimist, you know, and I'm always thinking out of the box. Uh, Elon thinks way out of the box. <laughs> way out of the box. But we need people like that. Yeah. You know, to, to keep that kind of spirit uh, of innovation. But but usually I tell people, because I get asked a lot about, uh, you know, Elon Musk is going to Mars. I tell people, yeah, it's great to have vision like this, but I wouldn't put my retirement money in his Mars company. <laughs> <laughs> Charles, the last topic I'd like to engage with you today is the overall political and budgetary environment of JPL as the Cold War was drawing to a close. You know, we already talked about the, the, the influence, first of all, for you of Sputnik and the birth of NASA from a military organization, the influence of Lou Allen. So when the Soviet threat and the Soviet competition was no longer there, how did that change in, you know, 1992, 1993? Did you feel those changes at JPL? Yeah, no, they, they did happen, uh, both during the Cold War and somewhat after it. So during the Cold War, as things were coming, you know, uh, relaxing a little bit, uh, there was a significant reduction then. I mean, there was a big funding for NASA in the 60s and the early 70s. Then come late 70s and in the 80s, there was a significant decrease uh, in the funding. Uh, part of it was going to the shuttle, part of it that the competition was less. So, uh, and, and it's interesting because indirectly in retrospective, that impacted my career. Uh, because as things in the 80s start coming down, uh, there was less and less funding for planetary. Because planetary was one of the things of competing with the Russians, get to Mars first and so on. And then it became apparent at JPL that uh, maybe we need to uh, diversify what we do at JPL. And that's what got us to be more involved in Earth observation. Although we had a little bit, you know, with CSAT and the shuttle imaging radar. So we ended expanding significantly in building instruments which went on Goddard Space Center spacecraft, not necessarily on JPL spacecraft. And for a couple of years, when I was the head of the instrument, and that's what led to forming that directorate and Lou Allen appointing me for it. So it had some traceability to the Cold War, not directly, but, but indirectly to it. And for some years, we were doing more work business at JPL in instrument than we were doing with spacecraft. So it was kind of the reverse of, uh, of what happened on doing that. Then as things progressed and the Cold War when then there was still competition and and the US wanted to build a relationship with different countries. So I remember during the Bush administration, there was a lot of encouragement to start working with India. Matter of fact, before that, uh, during the Nixon administration, there was encouragement to work with China. 
So there, was, there is always a political factor, you know, which comes in. I mean, we, we love to think everything is purest, but, but there is a little bit of political factor. I mean, but clearly our relation with Europe had political, uh, because of friendliness and, of, you know, collaboration and partnership. But then during the Nixon and shortly after that, there was encouragement to work with China. Things have changed by now. It's the opposite. And then during the Bush son, uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, building relationship with India, which have led to a lot of collaboration, you know, with India. And we have, in fact, we have a mission, a radar mission that I started on when I was director and now it will be launched, you know, uh, two years from now in 2023. Uh, jointly with the Indian Space Agency. So, uh, so yeah, th these had impact, you know, at GPL. And then the budget went up and down depending how proactive NASA wanted to be, not only for exploration, but also building a relationship with international, you know, organizations. Did the end of the Cold War allow for new opportunities of collaboration with the Russians? Yeah, no, for a while it, it did do that. Uh, the biggest benefit of it came from the human program. You know, it came with the space station, which led to it. And even before that, there was a little bit of collaboration. I mean, the science community always collaborated to a certain extent. And it was encouraged because by the politician, because that was a channel of communicating through the scientists at different places. So so we had uh, the Russian did a, uh, a mission to... Uh, to uh, the, do a balloon on Venus, and JPL was involved in the communication on it. Uh, matter of fact, on uh, uh, on uh, Curiosity, there was some instrument from the Russian. You know, it was a magnet uh, magnetometer or some instrument which was done by the Russian, and and there were discussion of collaboration. It was not as extensive in uh, in the robotic program. It was much more extensive in the human program, which, as I said, led to the space station and collaboration with them. <laughs> Where the collaboration ironically came from is after the Soviet Union collapsed and Russia was going through a tough time on it, there was a significant immigration of Russian scientists, space scientists. And a number of them ended at JPL, you know, coming in and working at JPL. Uh, and many of them were, you know, when we were trying to reduce uh, arms and nuclear, nuclear arms, were many of the scientists in the research lab in Russia, uh, there was less and less work for them. So they built on their connection with the U.S. and scientists in the U.S. to actually immigrate and come and work in the U.S. Charles, finally, a budgetary question, one that I've heard from several physicists in thinking about why funding for the SSC in Texas never came through. I've heard it, and this is something that I haven't been able to confirm that the Clinton administration saw these things in binary terms, that either it was going all in to fund the SSC or it was going all in to fund the space station. Do you have any insight on that and the issues that the Clinton administration was facing? Yeah, no, I heard all of these things. You know, for, uh, now, if I don't have a direct proof that this was really what happened, space station versus the SST. I mean, clearly the SST is much more esoteric for a politician in Washington, you know, and understanding all these elementary particles versus a space station which flies, you know, up uh, in the sky and has a lot of uh, what I call soft power, you know, which is clearly that's uh, uh, space exploration, astronaut, uh, uh, space has a lot more soft power than uh, elementary particles, even that they are both very important. I mean, no, no question. Uh, so, yeah, there was those trades. And, and there were an impact on NASA also in, in some situation. Uh, the infamous Magellan that we kept talking about, you know, the mission, when the Reagan, uh, Reagan administration came in in 1980, we were just starting to work on uh, what became Magellan. And then there was a big cut for NASA. And Magellan was canceled, you know, literally canceled. And then we had to really struggle both politically and technically to figure out a way to do it significantly cheaper than it was before. So we did changes of configuration, like using the antenna both for communication as well for the radar. So it was challenge of reviving it. So many, many, many uh, missions at NASA planetary mission, depending who and in politics, you know, saw kind of a temporary death 
for them and then they were revived. And that's where maybe at the future time we can talk about the key role of building the relationship that the JPL director, as well as NASA in general, and the Caltech board and building a relationship with the political part, you know, of, uh, of the government and get them excited about it. So it's not only because it's in their district, but also because it's a great thing for the nation. And the JPL director plays a key role in making that happen. And that may be travel to Washington almost every other week. Well, Charles, on that note, we'll pick up for next time the five years leading to your directorship at JPL. <laughs>